today uh, we have Kayvon Fatahalian from uh, Stanford. Um, I first met uh, Kayvon when uh, actually he was uh, interviewing uh, uh, as a prospective student. Uh, and uh, at that time, of course, uh, we were very sad that he chose Stanford. Uh, but it turns out it's a very good thing because now we can actually interview him for a, a faculty position. Otherwise, it would have been harder. Um, so um, Kayvon has been working on a whole bunch of different things. And I'm told he could have finished three or four PhD thesis uh, with, with the stuff that he has done. Um, so he will be talking to you mostly about one of them. Uh, the last one. Yeah. And, um, but his interests are, are fairly broad, as some of you have met him already today. And uh, um, anyway, okay. take it away, Kevin. All right. All right. So thanks, Arm. A topic that I've been very interested in, basically, since I began my, my undergraduate career, is the question of how to design high performance systems that also are very reasonably easy to program, and more and more so these days, power efficient. So in no way, shape, or form is this a new problem, but it is becoming increasingly prevalent at all scales of computing, from the cloud to mobile, and many people have already sort of said this to me today. Um, and in response to this challenge here and in a lot of other places, there has been a lot of innovation. So you've got the hardware architects that are going off trying to push multi-core parallelism out to wider and wider scales. You've got a bunch of different schools that have sort of been playing around with exposing the memory hierarchy, leaving it up to optimization by, for programmers or optimizing compilers. And you have like people like Chuck Moore out there at AMD that are going around saying that the future of parallel computing is not just parallel, but in fact, almost certainly going to be heterogeneous. Now, at the same time, there's been this big rush to develop new programming abstractions that are going to make it feasible for non-expert programmers to make reasonable use out of these more exotic machines. And kind of like what Zoran alluded to, at Stanford, I've worked on a number of fairly general parallel programming systems. And I'll come back and I'll talk about these at the end of the talk very briefly. But uh, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to talk about what my dissertation work has been for basically the last year and a half. And that's been designing a system with a with narrower domain focus. And that system is designed for interactive rendering. So I have always found graphic systems very interesting because they are both easy to use. And at the same time, they are these efficient, heterogeneous parallel systems. And they're easy to use because one thing I think we've done pretty well as a field is that we've come up with good programming abstractions in graphics. Right? And in graphics, that major abstraction is a concept called the graphics pipeline. And the graphics pipeline structures computation. It gives it some structure. And that structure is a series of computations and what happens to be a very small number of entities. Okay? Now, the details of this pipeline are not that important. If I do a good job today, I'll give you all the details about the graphics pipeline that you'll need. But what is important is that this pipeline does not require anybody to do any explicit parallel programming. And these entities that it uses, well, they're, they're quite intuitive, meaning that if you know enough graphics to make a picture from concepts like vertices or triangles or pixels, you pretty much have all the high order bits on how to program a graphic system. Okay? And now these abstractions, they're implemented today in what happens to be a heterogeneous multi-core GPU. So what I'm showing you here is I'm showing you a very simple block diagram of NVIDIA's latest GPU. This is the chip that came out last week or maybe two weeks ago. So this is brand new. And most of this die is taken up by the yellow boxes. That's all that's important. And these are 16 programmable cores. And these programmable cores offer software up to 1.5 teraflops of peak performance, which you know, if you're counting is about 15 times the compute performance of if you hand tune some SSC code for a high-end quad core chip these days. Now, these cores. They're optimized for throughput using what should be, to many of you, some very familiar techniques. They leverage wide SIMD processing. They use hardware multi-threading to a fairly extreme degree. And on there, they have on-chip memories like scratch pads or traditional caches. So to give you an example, this NVIDIA chip, they can interleave 48 instruction streams. Each of those instruction streams is operating, can operate with 32 wide SIMD instructions. And if you multiply those two numbers together, what you have is that you have a a core, not a chip, a single core that is operating on more than 1,500 pieces of data at once. So that's 1,500 vertices or pixels or whatnot. So these programmable elements, they are optimized for a high degree of data parallelism. 
Now, also on this chip, these generic components are augmented with a bunch of fixed function components that are indeed specific to graphics. And some of those components do exactly what you might expect. They are compute accelerators, and expensive parts of the graphics workload are not done in software. They are done efficiently on these fixed function components. But the other ones, and the ones that we think are really interesting, actually, are the, are the gray boxes that aren't there for compute heavy stuff. There's stuff that's on that chip to take responsibility for parts of the workload that don't map well to data parallelism. So that's the irregular algorithms used in graphics. It's data-dependent synchronization, data-dependent control. And there's a lot of this in a graphics workload today. So together, this combination of resources um, is very, very efficient for modern rendering workloads, sort of as evidenced by the fact that GPUs are ubiquitous and they're cheap, <coughs> and you can, you, know, you can get one for about 500 bucks. Now, even at this level of optimization, the best images that, that I can render in real time on a modern GPU still have fairly low geometric detail. So what I'm showing you here is an example that I've been given from, from Disney's Up video game. This is on the PlayStation 3. And you can see that this image is just, uh, there are geometric artifacts all over it, showing off the fact that the underlying mesh is very low resolution. So you can see on Russell's hat, you see the polygonal artifacts, you see it in his fingers and on his hair. Um, on his clothing. And to give you an even better example, well, the supposedly detailed ground plane is in fact modeled by a plane, right? even though it's supposed to be this bumpy surface. So let me be a little bit more quantitative for you now. So here's a histogram of triangle sizes uh, for the, the highest end games today, averaged over a number of different frames. And so you see that there are kind of two bumps in the histogram. There are a lot of triangles that are about a few pixels to a few tens of pixels in size. But there are a whole lot of triangles that are well more than 100 pixels in size. So even on high-end high workloads today, a lot of the screen is covered by these larger triangles. Okay. So the question, and one of these projects that I've done as a, as a PhD, the question that I asked myself about two years ago was what would it take to go from these highly optimized systems that are designed for this workload to something that could render pictures like this? So here's an example from Up! the movie. And I'd like you to notice the geometric detail that's present in the scene. So the background has intricate metalwork. There's actually geometrically modeled fur on the dog Doug. And you can see there's been a lot of attention to detail in the characters, in their clothing, and the, <coughs> the scarves and the hats. Okay? And so to get this level of geometric detail in rendering, high resolution meshes are required. Right? And what I mean by high resolution is, in fact, this. So here's a, a, a visualization of the mesh. In our prototype render, um, you can see it's a highly detailed surface. I'm overlaying it on a pixel grid. And you can see that all of the triangles to represent this surface are about a pixel in size or less. So basically, if you go back to the histogram, I'm interested in workloads where all of the triangles are in that leftmost 0 to 1 pixel bin. Okay? So we wanted a system that could render this workload, these types of meshes. And what I found out was that it's, in fact, very inefficient to render micropolygons using the OpenGL graphics pipeline that we have today and corresponding GPU implementations. And what I mean by that is if I could take today's GPUs and I could scale them up, meaning if I could add cores, if I could add bandwidth, if I could add the ability to synchronize across this future magical chip, what I would have would be a more powerful but an inefficient system for high quality render. Right? So this was not what we wanted. And the problems, or the reason for this, was that there were some problems with the abstractions that we used. And there were some problems with the underlying implementation. So let me quickly give you a sense of why. So the first problem is it was inefficient to get these triangles, these little polygons, into the pipeline. And at the level, the resolutions that I'm talking about, I'm not going to be able to pre-compute, and I'm not going to be able to store the polygon representation of the entire complex scene. So the triangles, or the polygons, need to be generated on demand from some compact representation in the pipeline. This is what, in graphics, we refer to as tessellation generating triangles from surfaces. And algorithms for doing high quality tessellation, getting polygons that are all about the right size, well, they turn out that they're difficult to parallelize, and they can't be expressed with current graphics pipeline abstractions very well. Now, the second problem is that if we have these triangles, you then want to figure out what pixels they overlap. And the computations, the way we do this today, we parallelize these computations over the pixels that might be overlapped. So in this example, I'm showing you a fairly large triangle. I'm overlaying it on a pixel grid. And you can imagine the computation to determine what pixels are overlapped by this triangle. It's parallelized across pixels. 
And for the workloads that I'm talking about, where a pixel is, a, a triangle is less than a pixel in size, well, that axis of parallelism just disappears on me. So the throughput of this part of the pipeline, which is fundamental to graphics as well, also drops significantly. And then last, what turns out to be the most expensive part of a graphics pipeline, which is computing what color a surface is, well, I'll just tell you now that, that the efficiency of this part of the system drops by almost an order of magnitude. And the reason here is interesting, and I'll leave the details to when I give you a solution later in the talk, but it's not that any of the compute units are running inefficiently, it's that the pipeline is generating about eight to, to nine times more work than is actually necessary to produce a good picture. Okay? So I set out to, to try and correct these problems, or to render micropolygons efficiently in some future system. And I figured out that there were these three major problems to solve. This problem with tessellation, this problem with rasterization, and this problem with shading. So for the really hardware-centric guys in the room, I should say up front that our goal in this project was not to build a GPU in the lab. We were not trying to create an entire end-to-end -end chip. It was to solve these problems in a manner that would influence the design of future GPUs. We were very careful about what battles we, took to, we picked to fight. And that's what we did. And I'm going to talk about two of the solutions today. I'm going to talk about the solution to tessellation. I'm going to talk about the solution to shading. Because I think they're particularly good examples of what, we kind of, what I kind of think of as a graphics approach to building these parallel systems. Uh, and the, they're, good, they're good examples of how we preserve or we create convenient abstractions while also leveraging heterogeneous parallel implementations. Okay? So let me start here by telling you how I turn these surfaces into these triangles in parallel. Now, if you're familiar with graphics, you know that there's a long history of literature of doing this. There are many ways. But what I'll tell you is that there were two ways that were on my performance quality roadmap. And the first of which is an algorithm. It's called Lane Carpenter. It's been around for a while, as you might see. And it's basically at the heart of every picture that Pixar has ever made. Now, Lane Carpenter produces good tessellations, high quality meshes, but it's hard to parallelize. Okay? And at the other end of the spectrum, there's a form of tessellation that's emerging in the latest GPUs, like the one I showed you today, which produces lower quality meshes, but was designed from the beginning to be parallel and high performance. And to keep a long story short, what we ended up doing in this part of the project was create a new algorithm and integrate it into the pipeline that combined the best of both of these approaches. OK, so I like to think about things in terms of inputs and outputs. And what you should know for the purpose of this talk is that a surface is represented by input parametric patches. Think about them as bicubic patches, and we have some ways in graphics of adding detail to this type of smooth surface. And the output of tessellation that you want is a micropolygon mesh, right? And that approximates the surface represented by these patches. And I want a good sampling of the surface. And by a good sampling, I'll just tell you that I want all the triangles to be about the same size, and I want all those triangles to be about a half pixel in size. Okay? Now, the first thing you might think of, of doing with these parametric surfaces is chopping them up completely equally in their parametric domain. So that's what I'm showing you here on the left. Okay? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, when you say you're adding detail, is that procedural or driven map? Displacement, either via procedural or via texture mapping. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The question was how. I'm supposed to repeat the question. Um, the question was, what did I mean by adding detail? Oh. OK, so if you chop the surface up uniformly in its parametric domain, depending on the surface properties or depending on view, you obviously can get polygons that are too small at the top of the screen, which means I've created too many and I'm introducing extra work throughout the rest of the graphic system. Or I've created polygons that are too large, which are going to suffer potentially from the artifacts that I started this talk with, polygonal artifacts. So this is why any scheme that, needs to, that has to produce a good tessellation has to be adaptive in parametric space in some way. And that's exactly what Lane Carpenter does. Okay. So Lane Carpenter is a divide and conquer algorithm. And it's an, it's an irregular divide and conquer algorithm that's going to partition the surface adaptively into smaller and smaller regions until it gets down into small enough localized regions where efficient uniform tessellation is sufficient for quality needs. So it basically does this. Now, the inherent problem in adaptive tessellation is that by design, different regions of the surface are tessellated at different rates. And at the boundaries of these regions, for example, here, the red, the red region and the blue and the yellow region, well, the polygons that I've created, well, they don't line up. The positions of the vertices, the positions of the polygons don't line up. And let me give you a better example of that here. So in the top right, I'm showing you two regions of a surface, call them region one and region two. Um, I'm showing you the division of those regions of the surface in their parametric space into polygons. And since they're tessellated at different rates, notice that the triangles, they don't match up, right? Now, 
when you look at the actual polygons that result in, in world space, when the surface is curved and those polygons don't match up, the surface rips apart at this boundary, right? And the ripping apart is, means that there's a hole in the surface and the hole will manifest as what we tend to call cracks in graphics. And these are the black pixels in the image here, okay? So this is a, this is a showstopper. This is a high frequency visible artifact that no graphic system would tolerate. Okay, so the status quo in fixing these cracks is actually to insert a strip of triangles, which, is the gray, which are the gray triangles there. And those triangles fill the crack and create, uh, and <coughs> they fill the crack by connecting the two regions, okay? So while this fixes the crack, what it's done is it's created a dependency. There now needs to be communication between these adjacent regions of the surface to figure out what stitch geometry to create. And it's this communication that prevents me from processing the individual regions of the surface in parallel and this is the reason why Lane Carpenter doesn't parallelize very well. Now, there's a solution. You can avoid this communication if these adjacent regions can be made independently to agree at these boundaries. Right? And so in this example, even though the red and the blue regions are tessellated at different rates, they're tessellating the, the boundary at the exact same way. Okay? And this agreement is possible and independently computable if the tessellation on a boundary is entirely a function of surface properties along that edge that doesn't depend on either of the, of the other sides. So if you do this and you mess, you mess with the uniform tessellation a little bit, you now have patches that can be processed, in, or sub-patches that are processed independently and in parallel. So this fancier form of tessellation looks like this. The input of these five constraints, and the output is a mesh topology that's uniform on its interior, it's uniform along each of the edges in, in accordance with these constraints, okay? So this semi-uniform form of tessellation is exactly what GPUs support today, but what they don't support is the adaptive patch partitioning that's present in Lane Carpenter, right? And so they work like this. The input to the system, the base patch data and constraints, we can generate the mesh topology with fairly simple table-driven hardware, and because by design these meshes line up, they can process, be processed by subsequent pipeline stages completely in parallel. And so the name of the game here was to try and integrate this type of scheme with the adaptive partitioning of Lane Carpenter. Okay. Now, this turned out to be kind of tricky because if you let this adaptive irregular algorithm divide, <coughs> divide the patch freely, it can get in situations where it cannot create subpatch regions that align at these boundaries. Okay, so let me give you a sense of why. So let's say Lane Carpenter has performed adaptive splitting and there are three regions here. Okay, and I'll go ahead and give you tessellations for two other regions. Okay, and so, let me think, uh, so let's think about tessellating the region on the right. The left edge of this region, well, it can't be tessellated uniformly because its top half needed four segments, its bottom half needed three, so Lane Carpenter needs to partition this patch, right? It needs to be adaptively tessellated. What you can get in these situations where you need to split the patch, but if you split it in half, you could not meet the constraints of all the edges, right? And so this sounds like a fairly simple problem, but this is a problem that actually been around in rendering for a long time. I, I told you that Lane Carpenter had actually been around since the 80s. And it turns out that there's a really simple solution. And the simple solution that worked for us was to, in fact, allow the algorithm to make these non-isoparametric cuts, okay? And so no longer were we making isoparametric divisions in half. And this, little, and this small change actually allowed for us to have this new algorithm, which we call diag split because of the non-isoparametric cuts. It was adaptive, it was crack-free, and it was also subpatch parallel. Now, the obvious question is how well does this new scheme adapt? And I'll, you know, I can answer it quickly by saying that both Diag Split and this old Lane Carpenter scheme produce roughly the same tessellations. So remember what I told you was that I wanted triangles to all be about the same size and I wanted them to be about a half pixel in area. Okay, now these two visualizations are visualizations of triangle size relative to that target size of a half pixel in area. So when the image is green, the algorithms are hitting that the exact rate uh, exactly. And warmer colors indicate over tessellation, cooler colors indicate under tessellation. So in this example of both of the images from back there look the same to you, that's good, because both of the algorithms are producing about the same tessellation. In this particular case, Diag Split is producing a tessellation with 7% more vertices. But remember, it meets my parallelism goals, well, the, alternate, the 
where Lane Carpenter did not. Okay? And in other situations, the Dyack split algorithm will produce slightly fewer or slightly, slightly more vertices. Now, in comparison to the uniform tessellation that I told you about, Dyag split meets our goals much better. And in this example, because Dyag split avoids, well, Dyag split can avoid under tessellation. So here, are the, blue re the blue regions here indicate under tessellation and qu possible quality problems. Dyag split avoids those regions while still producing a mesh with 40% fewer vertices because it can avoid over tessellation. And this is important because by not over tessellating, this is a work that does not trickle through the more expensive parts of the rest of the system. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through a really detailed evaluation here, but from a quick glance at other scenes, um, you can get the sense that this algorithm adapts very well under a variety of conditions. So the images on the right are basically all, all green. Okay. Now, here's the slide that I actually think is pretty important which is how all this fits together in the graphics pipeline. Because this is what the reason the, al the algorithm was designed in this way for a reason. So remember, base patches without constraints come in. The diag split algorithm creates sub-patches sub or sub-regions with these edge constraints. We use this form of uniform tessellation to produce meshes for each of these regions. And those meshes, by design, can be processed in parallel. And more so, the vertices in each of the meshes can be processed in a data parallel form. Now, the integration into the pipeline echoes these three computational characteristics. The data parallel processing of vertices executes on the programmable cores, and it is left programmable so that the user can choose any type of surface as long as it's parametric. The uniform mesh generation is carried out with very simple fixed function hardware, because it's very easy to build that hardware. And the adaptive diag split process is also kept under the interface of the system because the, this, this computation, it allows for a variety of parallel implementations which impact global decisions in how we parallelize the pipeline. So we kept that out of the user's control. Okay. So the summary of this part of the talk is that what we started to do is we went out to parallelize Lane Carpenter. That was the initial goal. And what we ended up with was a new algorithm that was designed to better meet the needs of our system. And the new algorithm produces completely different output. The triangles are different, but they are completely valid and, and good enough for our needs. Compared to uniform tessellation, the adaptivity can save me up to 8x the number of vertices that are generated and inserted into the system. And again, by design, from the beginning, the algorithm is factorable into data parallel components which can easily be run on the programmable cores, and irregular components that can be implemented easily with fixed function hardware and can be highly parallelized. Yes? So we saw what I assume is the qualitative result. This is like, it came out green. Uh -huh. What about the quantitative result from all of the parallelism that you were therefore exposed? How much faster did it render? Or can you give any sense of that? I know you didn't build. Yeah, we didn't build the image system. And even another question is, is if I, if I produce a, a lower quality mesh, does that result in visible artifacts, which is a similar question. The, uh, the qualitative, sorry, <laughs> the qualitative answer is that most of the time in these graphics systems, most of the work is going to be in shading, the shading the vertices and processing the vertices. And in fact, in this system, it is always over 75% of the workload when running uh, optimized code on, uh, on, core, on core i7s, so parallelizing out to a bunch of, of core i7s. So the, the performance of the end-to-end -end system in a system that's dominated by vertex processing, which is, which is common, is going to track the number of vertices that you generate very closely. So that is why I gave you that metric. I was giving you those numbers as well, is that in comparison to Lane Carpenter, the number of vertices that you, you produce is always very similar. They're always plus or minus about 5 to 10 percent. In comparison to uniform tessellation, when, making, when trying to set the algorithms to equal quality, you can produce up to eight times fewer vertices. So that's eight times less work that's going through the rest of the system. And your end-to-end -end wall clock time is going to reflect that number very sharply. Very closely. So, let me just yeah, see if I get this. So, you're saying then, uh, quantitatively, performance wise, you are much better than, um, what did you call it? Uniform. Yeah, uniform. Uh, because you have fewer vertices. So, I'm just wondering, you know, your picture quality was similar to the. Uh, oh, so you want to know how much faster? So I don't know how much faster, given the same picture quality, were you in fact faster? 
or, or you also said that the training was the, was the biggest component of this pipeline. So are you saying that we got the same quality, but it didn't have a huge impact in performance? Or? Let me, try, let me try and answer your question, and if I screw it up, just, just ask me again. Okay. Um, so the first, the first thing is that compared to, compared to Lane Carpenter, which is hard to parallelize, um, I cannot give you a precise number because we did not parallelize that in our system and, and do that evaluation. And the evaluation that we, we didn't do that was basically because we felt it was a showstopper to have a dependency and not be able to process individual parts of the surface in parallel. So I can't give you a serial number to answer your question in, in the way I want, you want me to answer the question. Um, the way we thought about doing the evaluation was the question is what was the cost of the adaptivity in comparison to uniform? And the answer to that question is that it pays for itself and that by reducing the number of vertices in the system, I do less vertex processing. And so the actual cost of producing a better tessellation is, is less because of the adaptivity. So most of our evaluation was focused on the delta from uniform and not on the comparison against this algorithm that we knew we couldn't parallelize. So yeah, I, I understand that might be a little unsatisfactory, but we thought about that one a lot. And, um, yes, sorry. You made a comment that the tessellation that was produced is different than Lane Carpenter, but about the same quantity. Is that same quality and quantity? The triangles are different. The vertices right. are in different locations. The fact that those triangles are different, does that impact image quality? It does not impact image quality. In all, you know, the, the bigger problem were those bright red regions, or the bright blue regions, where triangles would get too small. Um, that is where you'd see image quality problems. No more. OK. OK, so the second part of the talk, what I wanted to talk about was, now that I've told you how we generate the polygons in parallel, how we feed the pipeline, I wanted to talk about how we compute the color of them. And that in graphics is what we refer to as shading. And this was an interesting situation, because the abstractions were just fine. This is going to be about changing implementation. Okay. And to set the system problem up properly, actually what I have to tell you, I've got to talk about some graphics. And I have to tell you about what is actually one of the better ideas in graphic systems. Uh, historically, and that's a concept called multi-sample anti-aliasing. And so this is going to be an example where what was a very good idea for the last 10, 10 years or so is about to bite us really badly when we want to go to these high quality rendering, to the high quality rendering. Okay, so to set this up is once we have the triangles, we want to figure out what pixels they overlap. And here again, I'm showing you a bigger triangle just for uh, explanatory purposes, and I'm showing you the pixel grid. And GPUs compute this coverage by direct point sampling. So now I'm showing you the location of these sample points. And if you're wondering why there are multiple sample points per pixel, well, it's because we use super sampling of this cover of these point and polygon tests to estimate partial coverage, which is used to smooth out edges for anti-aliasing. Okay? And in a modern GPU, smoothing edges is important. And I'll just go ahead and tell you that there are about, you know, in general, four to 32 samples per pixel is now becoming status quo. Now, shading computations. Computing what color everything is, is very expensive. That's all the lighting, that's all the material simulation in these scenes. And so we, GPUs actually shade triangles at a lower resolution. They shade triangles once per pixel. And we can get by with shading once per pixel because texture data, the source of high frequency content in shading, can be pre-filtered prior to its sampling to avoid aliasing. So in this example, I'm showing you two images. They're both shaded exactly once per pixel, and I bet it's pretty hard to see, so I'll zoom in. And so here's a zoom in of, of that region, and you can see that the pre-filtered texture data, the high frequency has been taken out a priori, there's no aliasing in the right image. There's aliasing in the left image. Both of these images have the same shading computation, so the status quo in rendering is on the right. Now, to compute the amount of filtering that needs to be performed, the pipeline needs to compute derivatives of shading values on the surface. Right? And these derivatives are computed by taking differences between these values in adjacent pixels. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing you might be thinking is, well, derivatives or, or differences between pixels, isn't that introducing communication between these pixels in a data parallel pipeline? And in fact, graphics architectures always shade at the granularity of two by two pixels to, to make sure that this communication does not, avoid, uh, does not impact the way we parallelize. So the minimum granularity of shading is a two by two pixel region. The technical term is a quad fragment. And this is the granularity of parallelism for shading in a graphics pipeline. Okay. 
So going back to the original example, here's the triangle. Here are the quad fragments that are shaded as a result of sampling the triangle. And I'm going ahead and showing you the location at which shading is sampled with the black dots. Okay, so this is how GPU works. No questions. Okay, good. Now, because of these two ideas, which I told you are, are very important ideas in how we've rendered images for a long time, anti-aliasing edges and shading on quad fragments to have derivatives but also parallelism without communication, means that whenever two triangles from the same surface meet, pixels get shaded more than once. So this is a, a, a visualization of the number of times these pixels get shaded as a function of both of these triangles flowing through the system. And you can see that along the edge where quad fragments get generated for both of the triangles, those pixels are sh shaded more than once. So for the triangle sizes that I told you about, for big triangle sizes, this overhead is very manageable. Most pixels lie within the interior regions of polygons, and it's not that big of a deal. Okay? But as triangle sizes shrink to the systems that we want to build, or we want to, to the workloads that we want to run, more and more pixels end up near edges. And at the micropolygon level, this becomes quite severe. So if you look at the image on the right, which I even stopped short of the half pixel triangles that I told you I wanted, you can see that the surface is shaded more than eight times per pixel. And remember, we wanted to shade it once. Okay? And these computations are, again, the expensive, really expensive part of the pipeline. <coughs> and so this is, this is quite, quite a big problem. OK, so here's how everything's working. The triangles come in that were produced by tessellation. The rasterizer will compute a quad fragment for every pixel or for every two by two region that they overlap. So that stream of quad fragments is shown here in white. And the coverage, or sort of the part of the quad fragment overlapped by these triangles, is shown in red. Okay? And then the quad fragments are shaded in a data parallel fashion on these programmable cores. Now, what we observed here is that we know two things. We know that we're just not getting arbitrary triangles from the programmer anymore, like what exists in OpenGL today. We know that we're actually getting a mesh, that is all, all the triangles are part of the same surface. Because remember, we just created that, that mesh during tessellation. Okay? And so it makes sense that you're going to want to shade this mesh once per pixel in the same way that we used to shade these big triangles once per pixel. Okay? Now, the other thing that we know is that when, G, when a GPU is going to shade two quad fragments, from different triangles, but from the same surface at the same screen location, well, it's normally going to compute the same result twice. Okay? So in this example, triangle one covers the highlighted pixels, and it generates a quad fragment with this coverage, resulting from those point and polygon tests. And let's say that the shading computation comes out blue. Okay? The second triangle is going to come through the system. It's going to generate a quad fragment at the exact same location, and since we're shading the same surface at essentially the same point, it's going to come out almost exactly the same blue. And when these, when these two components, these two quad fragments, get blended into the final frame buffer, what you end up with are completely covered blue pixels. Okay, so the shading work that we did was highly redundant. Okay. Now, our approach for eliminating the redundant work was simply to merge quad fragments generated from different triangles on the same surface at the same location. Right? And the idea, and, the simple, and our simple solution was in fact just to insert a buffer following rasterization that buffers these quad fragments. Quad fragments at the same location are identified, and they are potentially merged. So the idea here is that a much smaller number of quad fragments ultimately arrive at the shading system, and the amount of work that we do is reduced substantially. Okay. So one way to think about this is that we're sharing the results of shading computations across nearby triangles on the same surface. Now, the reason why this was hard, I, des I described it fairly simply. The reason why this was hard was in the system determining on the fly which merges could, could be done and avoiding merges that caused rendering artifacts. Okay. And let me give you um, probably the most common case. Okay. And this is, um, this is why this problem was tricky. So consider the surface which folds over on itself. And I, like I said, we're interested in highly detailed surfaces, so this is a common case. And because of the fold, triangles that aren't anywhere near each other on the surface end up projecting to the same pixel. Okay. Okay. Now, what a current GPU would do, since it processes all triangles completely independently, is it's going to shade all the triangles and then because of the multi-sample anti-aliasing that I told you about, 
It's going to shade some blue triangles. It's going to shade some white triangles. And the result is going to be a nice anti-aliased edge. Okay, so this is the light blue, the image that we want. Okay. But if you use the technique you know, that I just told you about, and we shade these pixels only once, I'm going to end up with a result that is either going to be all blue or it's going to be all white, depending on the choice of triangle that was used in the system, uh, used, to, uh, used to do the shading in the system. Okay. So one of the major insights of this, well, not the insights, but the idea behind this work was that we could only merge quad fragments that came from adjacent edges. And the insight that we had was that we could produce the adjacency information, because we were doing it anyways during tessellation. We could encode it very, very simply with, with bit masks. And then we could leverage it to identify when merges were possible later on in the pipeline. And the result of this was that an image that was overshaded dramatically like this ends up looking more like this. Okay, so in this particular example, the amount of work that was identified and removed from the pipeline on the fly was about 8.5x. And so you can see here that most of the image is actually shaded once. The obvious question is, what is this grid-like structure? The grid-like structure where you see shaded, shading happening more than once turns out to be the boundaries of the window that we look over in that buffer. So this image is equivalent in efficiency to a current GPU shading roughly 256 pixel triangles, right, which is well... Uh, easily tolerated today. And in the paper, we, we go through a fairly detailed evaluation of the quality about when, you know, do our decisions about merging or not merging work very well. And it turns out that it actually works extremely well. In this particular example, um, almost numerically to 8 bits precision, there's not a big difference at all in the output quality. And remember, the image on the left actually has more than 8 times, eight times less shading, more than 8.5 times less shading. And this 8x number tends, turns out to hold up over a wide variety of scenes. On average, we found a reduction of 8.2x. Situations where, and I can go into this in some of the questions, but the uh, situations where you don't see the 8x happen to be surfaces where there are a lot of folds, so the case that I told you about. So there actually are fewer opportunities to perform this optimization. It's not like we're actually missing things. So to recap here, so this was another example of leveraging domain knowledge to gain a fairly large speed up. And in this particular example, that domain knowledge was what work, could, what work was actually redundant. And we identified it and we eliminated it invisibly from the user in the system. Now, the logic that we introduced introduced communication. There was communication between these quad fragments and the merging and the buffering that previously did not exist in the system. But what we, what we were able to do is we were to isolate that irregularity to what turns out to be a very simple fixed function part of the system that requires only a very small amount of buffering. The storage overhead is less than 10%. Um, and by doing it that way, we have preserved, and this was a key aspect of our design, we preserved the data parallel programming model and the data parallel throughput cores that already existed in these GPU systems. Okay, so is any other questions on that part of the talk before I... Yes? So, uh, thanks for that, the AX. Sure. Um, so what does this, this mean that you can do in creating animations, say, that you couldn't do before? We can run the system basically... If you took these designs in a GPU and you took the, the overhead of their cost. And the overhead of the cost, for example, in the merging, is literally this merge buffer. And that merge buffer, I can t uh, in the paper, we talk about how it's less than 10% at the largest uh, of storage, is that we basically can run the system 8 to 8.5x faster. It is basically the throughput rate, the number of triangles, or the amount of shading that we can do per second with the exact same mesh, same high quality mesh, is about 8 to 9 times faster. So on a current GPU, you could render this today. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that the, the amount of work that is done, and with these optimizations, you would render this about 10, about 10 times faster. So actually, the question was more on the lines of what kind of pictures can, does this enable you to do, oh, or what type okay, of kind yeah. of real-time work can you mm -hmm. do that you couldn't do before? We want to get to a point. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. We want to get to a place you know, when we have the transistors to scale up the core count where real-time graphics is going to have the geometric complexity of film, which means it has uh, uh, fur, clothing, 
uh, rough, detailed, just detailed geometric surfaces, which to many of us is the first major step in getting to these high quality graphics. Because right now it actually, things look pretty good. And things look pretty good because the mesh resolutions are really low. And what's interesting is that actually hides a lot of the artifacts in the rest of the system with animation and with shading. And so if you went to really high quality meshes, then you're gonna have all the other problems that are about to, all the other stuff is gonna show up, I think. So that, that's how basically I, I answer the question, is that if you wanted to do movie quality, this is sort of the first major problem to solve along those, along those steps. Yes? Yeah, just to understand how far you are from that. You started out by saying there was a distribution of triangle systems. Okay. Uh, it looked like you wanted to get two orders of magnitude or maybe three orders of magnitude. Yeah. smaller triangles, and you, this gives you one of those three orders of magnitude. That's correct. So I am not saying that we can render these scenes in real time today. I'm saying that if, you know, pack more transistors on a chip, you give me more cores five to eight years from now, then we're going to be able to render those 100 to 200 million polygon scenes in real time, and this was the first order of magnitude to get there. And I think you just need sort of silicon scaling to do to do the rest. So, so yeah, th th that's why I was saying we were never going to build a GPU today because we knew we weren't going get to get where we wanted to be with just these optimizations. And so this is more of a prescription for what these companies should build about five years from now when they have the transistors. OK? OK, so to take a step back and summarize the project a little bit. Um, the goal, like you pointed out, was to increase the efficiency of how these rendering pipelines work. It wasn't to get all the way there yet. And we did it by tracking the problem on these three major fronts. And I told you about the tessellation and the shading front. We also looked, uh, we did a micro, a, a very detailed study of rasterization. And this, these, three, um, these three topics are resulted in papers and they constitute my dissertation at Stanford. And what I'm writing up right now is that like, like most systems, Actually, some of the really interesting stuff is in the interaction between the three components. And one of those interactions I tried to stress today was that the fact that we generated the polygons and the role of tessellation, we were able to use those semantics to come up with a major optimization downstream. Okay. Now, I got the idea to try this really only about a year and a half to two years ago. Um, and it's been a fairly small project. It involved five students, two of which were undergraduates, who I helped mentor their senior theses. And even though it's sort of a small project and it's, it's fairly young, it is beginning to have already some impact. Uh, for example, Intel has given uh, us direct engineering support. We are not porting to Larrabee. But they have dedicated engineers to take these ideas and build an end-to-end -end system internally on Larrabee. AMD has told us that they are evaluating the inter an internal hardware software version of, uh, <coughs> of the, the tessellation ideas on upcoming, for upcoming chips. And this idea of, of, of these ideas and shading actually resulted from a very tight collaboration between NVIDIA and Microsoft Research. And Kurt Akeley, who was the inventor of OpenGL, is now at Microsoft, and he's been working with us very closely on this project. Now, Kind of in retrospective, in thinking about what we did on this project and thinking about graphics in general, is we made very heavy use of domain knowledge to arrive at some optimizations that led to some fairly significant speed ups, um, allowed us to uh, use heterogeneous implementations, and allowed us to either preserve good abstractions or create new ones that were easy to use. And in many respects, this is pretty obvious, right? By narrowing the scope of a system, I can build something that better meets the needs of a certain class of users. But in thinking back to some of the other parallel systems that we've been working on at Stanford, I think there are a couple of good ideas in the way I would say graphics architecture, the way the graphics field kind of thinks about building systems. And so you guys may or may not agree with me on these, but these are what I think are two really good ideas from what I've observed. The first of which is the willingness to change algorithms to fit the system. And I don't mean porting existing algorithms, making them parallel, or restructuring them. I mean, from the very beginning when we designed these systems, the algorithms and changing those algorithms is fair game. And we're willing to consider from the very beginning new algorithms that, complete, that come up with completely different results. And it's only through the domain, uh, expert domain knowledge that we know when we can do that. And that's always been very, very important in thinking about the design of these systems. Um, graphics is clearly very amenable to this way of thinking. In this talk, you've, said, you've heard me say a couple times, well, if it looks right, it's good enough. But 
the more I talk to everybody, I mean, I hear about the big data computing that's sort of going on everywhere. I hear about probabilistic computing, statistical techniques. And I think a lot of these new domains that are really looking to leverage this compute power could benefit from more of this style of thinking. The other thing that I think is, is neat in comparison to some of the other stuff that I've done is that I think graphics has a very unique approach to exploiting heterogeneity. So most of the time when I hear about heterogeneity, and the way I used to think about it, was in the context of compute accelerators. So there was some compute heavy part of the workload, let's move it off to an FPGA or some fixed function block and accelerate it. But rendering is, this very, is an interesting workload that very, very tightly couples regular data parallelism with irregular control and irregular behaviors. And these graphics systems that we build, well, we do use fixed function processing to accelerate some of the compute heavy tasks. But we also use fixed function processing to isolate irreg irregularity and or data dependent control or irregular algorithms. And in our domain, it has the effect of actually keeping the programmable stuff more general and a lot more simple. Right? So I think it's an interesting instance of using heterogeneity to actually simplify the programming model instead of making it more complex. And so these are the, these are the questions that I've been, uh, I've been wrestling with a little bit more now that I'm starting to back away from this project. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was that, as uh, Zoran said, I have been involved in a number of parallel programming projects at Stanford. Um, and uh, when I first got to Stanford, I worked for a couple of years on the Brook Project. And I worked with Ian Buck, who later went on to NVIDIA to do CUDA. And I worked with Mike Houston, um, who later went on to AMD and is head of their compute group now. Um, and so Brook was one of the first attempts to abstract a graphics processor as a more general compute device. And then in response to some of the things that we didn't quite get 100% right with Brook, uh, I went off and, and helped start and led the initial design of the Sequoia programming language which is based on the idea that programming more complex heterogeneous or more complex machines might actually be easier if a more complicated, not more complicated, but a more sophisticated model of memory was embedded first class into the programming model. And Sequoia has actually led to a number of PhD theses at Stanford. Um, things that I think were, were sort of neat is that it's actually been used this year to teach the introductory programming class and also um, to my knowledge, and people here might actually correct me on this because I haven't <coughs> looked at it very much recently, is that Sequoia, I think to this day, remains the only single unified programming environment that has been used to program the hetero heterogeneous collection of resources like Roadrunner. We've never run Sequoia code on Roadrunner, but we've run it on all the test clusters for Roadrunner. Right? And, and this, is, this is interesting because this machine, which uses cell processors to accelerate computing, is sort of not a one-off. If you look at the plans to build exascale machines at, at Oak Ridge, they will also be a heterogeneous collection of resources. But I believe that they have been scheduled to use uh, NVIDIA GPUs, so the block diagram that I showed you at the beginning of this talk. And last, uh, and, and right before working on this rendering project, I was collaborating with uh, Jeremy Sugarman at Stanford on a system called Gramps. And Gramps actually take, tries to take a lot, lots of ideas from the graphics pipeline and generalize them for more, um, for more generic stream computing targeting heterogeneous multi-core architectures. So in Gramps, the main issue was to make the actual structure of the pipeline also programmable and then worry about issues with like scheduling onto these machines. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge, like I said, the five students five, there's a new one that's, yeah, five students on this project and some of the support that we've gotten from industry. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to get beat up with questions at this point, so. Yeah. The INX is based on the camera's viewpoint, correct? That's correct. Now, why is it before the <coughs> vertex shape, which can actually move around the uh, uh -huh. vertices like when doing yeah. uh, GPU skinning or something like yeah, that? Yeah, perfect. Uh, great question. Um, so it needs a heuristic. I did not tell you anything today about how the tessellation rates are computed, right? I left that detail out. That was a black box in this talk. That black box is what the application provider provides, right? So just like you provide a vertex program today, knowing what your vertex program does, you also provide a, a simple sequential piece of code 
that tells you how to set those rates, given whatever you are doing in the vertex processing phase. And it's not just uh, camera viewpoint, it's camera viewpoint and surface detail, like, like you pointed out. That's correct. Um, I was wondering where sort of the half, half pixel triangle came from, like that size and all Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and this is, this is a more graphics-y question. So half pixel, if you think about them being quadrilaterals, because it's more or less a regular lattice all over the place, the half pixels uh, triangle came from dividing a one pixel quadrilateral in, uh, in half, because we wanted to deal with triangles to keep rasterization simpler. The one, pi the one pixel quadrilaterals comes from putting a vertex once per pixel, which is uh, arguably twice the Nyquist rate, but in practice in graphics, we've found that basically one vertex per pixel for, for shading computations is where you want to be. So that's where the one half came from, is basically taking those quadrilaterals and slicing them in two. Time for maybe one question. Okay. So um, one of the things you've talked about as potential future work is taking ideas that you've learned in your research and extending them to other forms of parallel and heterogeneous computing. But one of the secrets, I think, of the success that you have is that your changes to the algorithm were in the stuff is hidden away from the programmer. Um, the, as you said, the, the, the tessellation, aside from having a tessellation program, you're exposing that detail to the program itself. That's correct. Right. So, so have you thought of how that's going to apply or, or any sort of low-hanging fruit in the broader space of yeah. what I do? So the short answer to the question is if I knew how it was going to apply, I probably would have done that for my thesis, <laughs> moving off of Sequoia. The, the more serious answer is, is that's where I think, in one respect, where I'm trying to go. And if you look at, if you look at for example, you look at the, the protein folding machines that they're building at D.E. Shaw, if you look at GPUs, if you look at a lot of these workloads, there do seem to be some common patterns and structures. Right? And identifying those and figuring out if we could codify them in more general programming primitives, or perhaps even a little bit more radically, uh, into the architecture itself uh, is an interesting idea that I've been thinking about. Um, we have all this fixed function stuff on GPUs today, right? And when anybody does anything else on a graphics processor, what they do is they write it, let's say, in CUDA. And what that essentially does is it turns off all the innovative stuff that we have in there for graphics, and it treats the device as a generic multicore and a harder to program generic multicore. <laughs> Right? So the question is, well, we do have certain things in that graphics chip that are very good at managing the irregularity, the dynamic scheduling, all the stuff that you need to run graphics efficiently. If I'm looking at these other workloads, if I'm looking at what scientists are trying to simulate, if I'm looking at some of these analytic work, analytics workloads, it's kind of the things that everybody is really talking about all over the place. I'm wondering if we can tweak some of those components that right now are specific to pixels and things like that, generalize them just a little bit a little bit more, and then make them much more broadly applicable to not everything, but to a much wider class of, of domains. So I can't give you a precise answer or a solution to the problem right now, but it's so, certainly something that um, I've definitely had discussions with many people, and we're trying to figure that out. But yes, it is the domain knowledge. And so I, I, I do believe moving all the way to completely general programming systems, there's certainly a place for that, but I think there's a place in the middle as well. All right, let's thank our speaker. Mm -hmm.